welcome. We're rapidly approaching the, the halfway mark. Started week five. Couple general purpose reminders for you. Not directly related to 201. You've no doubt seen the emails from Carlton ITS about the required password change uh, by February 7th. Uh, if you don't change your password by that time next week, you won't be able to get on the Wi-Fi, you won't be able to log on to the lab computers, uh, uh, you'll, be, you'll be very sad, so make sure to, to do that change. The ITS has very specific instructions because as soon as you change your password, if you have a phone or something that's using the old password to connect to Wi-Fi, it will try to connect a bunch of times with the wrong password and lock you out. And so ITS has very specific step-by-step -step instructions for doing this password change in a way that uh, shouldn't cause any problems. Other general purpose reminder, you've also gotten an email about the CS match. This is the process by which you can uh, secure a, a spot in a CS course of your choice. If you, uh, whether you are just maybe going to take a CS course next term or for sure going to take a CS course, uh, or probably not, but there's some chance you will, in any of those cases, you should fill out the match. Uh, it's, it's very useful, and because the CS department uses the match to fill spots in uh, courses past 201, if you don't fill it out, it can be quite difficult uh, to, to get into classes. Uh, any, any questions about the CS match that I can answer? Any questions on other 201 stuff, the, the lab, uh, sorting, recursion? Oh, yeah. Good question. When, uh, when will you know what courses are offered uh, in CS next year? Uh, the CS department is uh, figuring that out right now, so uh, it should be, uh, I think, advising days are in a couple weeks, so and I would expect that information would be would be available by then. Yeah, so DEF has to be ready before before registration, um, and and yeah, I would expect before advising days. Any other questions? All right, so a lot to get through today. I want to jump right into it. So last time we were talking about merge sort. Uh, to refresh your memory, our general outline is we're going to split the data into two halves. Recursively sort each of these two halves of our data. And then merge the sorted halves. For recursively sorting each half, does anyone remember what our base case was? When we no longer were going to split our data in two, or we didn't, didn't have to do any sorting. Peter? When we have one element in the list. Exactly. Base case, when we have one element, that's sorted. There's no way a, a, a single element can be out of sorted order. It's both first and last. So 
that's the point where we don't need to uh, do any more recursive sorting. That's our, our base case. So what we're going to do now is going to analyze the running time, get, uh, determine the big O efficiency of merge sort. And I want to start by looking at this merge into function. I put some of the code on the, for this on the board on Friday. Specifically went through this idea of we're going to have these two lists, list one and list two, and we want to merge them together into this result list. Um, and uh, yes, these peaks can be changed uh, to get zero. But the idea is take the first element in each list, whichever is smaller, that's the next one that goes into our result. And after that, if anything is left in one of the two lists, if one of them is longer than the other, then we just take all the things from that are left over. Those all must be bigger than anything we've already put uh, in our result list. So let's say that here n is going to be the total number of elements that we're merging together. We're merging list one and list two together, so let's say the size of our input is the sum of the sizes of these two lists. Uh, so I'd like you to uh, discuss with your neighbors what the big O of, of this method, how would we model what the efficiency of this merge is given the size of the input and size of our two lists. So remember, we can do this by going through each line, counting the number of steps, and importantly, how many times are loops going to go around. So work with your neighbors on this for a few minutes. Uh, all right. I think my, my first question for you might be, just thinking of the code inside this loop, separate from the question of how many times this loop is going to go around, but this code inside the loop, is this, is the amount of work this code is going to do, will it depend on uh, the size of our input, or, or will it be the same, or will it be some constant number of steps each time around the loop? Uh -huh. uh, it will be constant because it's not a loop. It only happens if it happens. It only happens once. Yeah, I think that's that's a uh, a good way to to look at this. That we'll have some uh, com we'll have a comparison and uh, uh, a couple remove uh, a remove and an add. Uh, anyone. Uh, have a or uh, anyone have a, a different idea of like would this is there a circumstance where this might not be constant? Elena? Like, isn't there a point where it's going to be empty? Like, that's like dependent on n? Yeah, and so. That's exactly right. That how many times this loop goes around, totally dependent on n, because it's going to go around until one of these two uh, things we've gone through through all of them. Uh, what I was uh, was getting at here is that this is only constant if adding to our list and removing from a list are constant. So we have to make sure to choose the right kind of list if we want. A list where removing from the end and adding to the end are constant. I think fortunately, the two 
our, our two main approaches, our linked list and our array list, both, at least on average, have this constant time to add and remove from the end. But just to call out that we, we are using these add and remove methods, so important to think about what is their efficiency since we're calling them from this, this function. Um, but yeah, as, uh, as Elena said, we go around this loop uh, once for each thing in the list. Uh, and if that happens, what would that make the, the efficiency of this, uh, of this whole loop here? Charlie? Sorry? Exactly. That we're going to do a constant amount of work for each of our inputs, which is we have some constant C times N for the amount of work. When we go to our worst case analysis and we get rid of all those constant factors, that leaves us with big O of N. Does that make sense how, how we got to this? Any questions on analyzing this merge into? Jeffrey? Yeah, I had a question. Are, are list one and list two already sorted in increased order when you make yeah. Yes, this merge operation assumes that you have already sorted these two halves and we're merging two sorted halves back together. Uh, otherwise, you have if that's not true, you have no guarantee that the result will be in sorted order. So yeah, list one and two have to already have been sorted. Elena? I'm a little confused why it's n. Sure, so why is this, this n? Uh, we want to ask kind of how many times around these loops will we go if our total kind of number of input elements that we're merging together is n. And, and see that in this first loop, it's going to go around until one of our two lists are empty. And so it will go around uh, as many times as whichever of these is smaller. Uh, and let's say in the case that all of list one is, is less than all of list two. So this first time around this loop, we go through all of list one, but none of list two. Uh, so maybe we're going through only some, some part of n. We don't know anything about how different these are in size. But then we look at these other while loops and see, OK, after this first one, we're going to go through each remaining thing in either list until they're empty. So this said, uh, OK, we're going to go through every single element in each of these lists by the time we're done with this function. And if we say n is the number of all those things, if that's how many times we go around one of these three loops altogether. Does that make sense? Other questions? All right, so now we can look at the sorting code. This applies our base case. We only have sorting to do if we have more than one element. Otherwise, if it's an empty list or there's only one thing in it, there's nothing to sort. Go through our Create two halves, fill them up with each with half of the elements in our original uh, list, and then do our two recursive calls, sorting the left and the right half recursively. So to complete our analysis of uh, merge sort, so our uh, merge was big O of n. And if our, if in this function we say n is 
Again, the size our input, only one list this time. Uh, up until the point where we do these two recursive calls, uh, would our, uh, would the amount of work be uh, linear in N or constant uh, or something else? Jeffrey? It would be linear. Why do you say linear? Because uh, there's two forks that go through both halves, so it would add up to n. Exactly. That one of these loops will go around about n over 2, half of n times, and the other one half of n times. So if we count up all the work, we're again going through each element of our input list as we split it up into these two halves. Uh, and so this first part of sort, again, uh, big O of n. So now so we have these different kind of big O of n components of our sort. And now the question becomes, how many times are we going to do this, kind of split things up and then merge them together? Because we have each of these steps where merge is O of n, sort up to the recursive part is O of n, and our total is going to be something times our O of n, where this something is Now, the number of recursive steps we have to do. How many times do we have to divide it by 2 and then merge it back together? Because each time we divide it by 2, that's order n. Each time we merge it back together, that's big O of n. How much is the size of our input changing each time we make a recursive call? Like if we say, OK, the size of list is n. What is the size of half one? N divided by two. N divided by two. We split it in half. Does anyone remember if we're repeatedly dividing something by two, how many times that happens until we you know, get down to our base case of, of one or zero? Sorry. Log of n? Exactly. Log of n is our expression for how many times can we divide n by 2 before we get down to, to 0. So the number of times we split in 2 and then after that merge back together is log base 2 of n. And so our total is usually written big O of n log n. Because we have to do log n repetitions of our linear kind of merge, uh, split up and merge steps. You might say, well, for each of our uh, steps, we have to do both the split up and the merge. So, Shouldn't this actually be big O of 2n log n? Because we have to do kind of split up and merge together. Why, why wouldn't we, we write it as 2n times log of n? Jeffrey? No, the constant 2 doesn't really matter, so you could just drop it. Yeah, when n goes to, to infinity, uh, when n gets really, really big, the difference between n log n and 2 n log n uh, is not something that's really going to matter. And so in our worst case uh, asymptotic analysis, we just say n log n. Does that make sense? Questions on, on how we got here?
So I have I have good news and bad news about about our merge sort algorithm. Uh, the good news uh, is that this is uh, as efficient as it's possible to get uh, with a comparison sorting algorithm, meaning an algorithm where we have to compare the values of elements directly. That's also the bad news. We can't do any better than this. Um, now, different, there are, merge sort is not the only n log n sorting algorithm uh, that people have come up with. Uh, and in practice, based on uh, different distributions of, of input data, some algorithms might perform uh, better than others. But from our kind of big picture asymptotic analysis, they're going to be n log n. All right. So we have our uh, uh, sorting task, our, our classic computer science, uh, uh, bringing, bringing order to chaos. Uh, we're going to talk about another classic computer science task uh, today, that, and you will be, be implementing an uh, uh, example of uh, this kind of algorithm in lab four. And that is, we were putting things in order, and now we are finding things. Uh, one of the uh, one of the the classic search algorithms is called binary search. Uh, have folks heard of this? Heard of this before? I know that it's sometimes. Uh, you might have seen it in, in 111, um, but you can think of binary search as sort of what you would do if you were playing a number guessing game with someone. So if I said, guess a number between 0 and 100, and I'll tell you whether your guess is too high or too low, what would you guess? Yeah, you guess 50. Why is 50 a useful number to guess? Sorry? It's the halfway point. Yeah, it's the halfway point. And if I tell you, oh, the uh, the number I'm thinking of is higher, what what do you learn? Well, you're ruling out the most possibilities. So you're saving the most amount of work if you go in the middle each time. Exactly. That when I tell you higher or lower, then uh, you can you know that you don't you can ignore everything that's in the other direction. And given that you don't know whether I'm going to say higher or lower beforehand, if you pick the middle, then you get to rule out, rule out half of uh, whatever the remaining possibilities are. So our binary search Put in kind of uh, sketched out. We want to kind of find where the the middle is. We want to check what's there. What is the what is this middle middle value compared to what we're looking for? So we have something we're looking for, and by checking. This middle value, how does it compare to what we're looking for? We can rule out half. And then we just keep doing this until we either run out of uh, uh, things to check or we find, uh, find something that matches, matches target. So going from our guessing game to what if we were doing binary search On a list, like we want to, we're searching for um, we're we're implementing a contains method. So uh, if we were to perform a linear search, 
uh, I have that on the, the screen now. Uh, we take in an array of numbers, and when we're looking for, and we're looking to return true, if target is in our array, false if it's not. And we could just go through, check each element in the array. Is this what we're looking for, true or false? If we wanted to use our binary search strategy on uh, to, to do this contains to find if a, a number is, is in our array, uh, we need to be able to, to find the midpoint and be able to rule out half of the list based on the value of that midpoint. Does anyone see what does our list need to be for these two steps to be possible? Luke? Absolutely. The binary search requires that our list is sorted. It's the only way that we can go to, say, the middle of our list and know that everything to the right of that is greater than the number in the middle and everything to the left is lesser. The only way that we can rule out half is if our list is sorted. Does that make sense? Questions on why we need a sorted list or this binary search outline? All right, so in the notes uh, for today, I have both the both an iterative and recursive version of binary search. I want to look at the recursive version because we're going to need to keep, keep thinking about recursion. So the first thing that I want to call your attention to is that to implement a recursive uh, binary search, a, a recursive version of our contains on some sorted array, we still take in the same array and target, but we actually need to keep track of more information than this. To do this recursively, we need to know kind of within the array, where is the kind of, what is the range of, of spots that we're still considering for our search? Because each time we rule out half, we want to change, okay, which is the first index we're looking at and which is the last index we're looking at. We're going to start it out as the entire list, and each time we're going to have sort of narrow it in one direction or the other. But since our contains method to be like our, our linear contains, we don't want the, uh, a person who's calling this to know how our have to know how our implementation works, know what the starting indexes should be. So we're going to have it. Uh, a helper method that does all the actual work. Where our helper method is going to take our array and it's going to take a low and a high index. It's going to take an index that is, this is the first index in the range that we're considering and high being the last index in the range we're considering. And then still take the target. And so our initial method says, okay, we're going to start off this recursive search starting at the first index, looking all the way to the last, still looking for target. And then our recursive code is going to go through these steps, but with an added base case. Base case is we have no more kind of elements in our array to consider. When our low index is gotten bigger than our high index, that means that the last time we kind of ruled out half, well, that, that was everything. And there's, there's nothing left that we haven't already checked. And so at that point, we can, uh, uh, we can say, OK, our list does not contain, our, our array does not contain the number we're looking for. Otherwise, we find our midpoint. That's the index halfway between our low and, and high. We can check, is the number there what we're looking for? And if it's not, based on whether the number we're looking for is greater than what we found we, or less than, we make a recursive call 
where we're either saying change the low up to like rule out the lower half or rule out, or rule out the upper half. So if we consider an example uh, where we have uh, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, uh, sorted array, uh, and we're asked to find uh, tell me if 10 is in this array. We make our helper function with our array, index 0, index 4, the index of the, the last spot in this array, and the number we're looking for. And so our kind of low starts at the beginning, our high starts at the end. We find our, our midpoint, 0 plus 4 divided by 2. That's here. And we check, does this equal 10? Sure doesn't. And is our target less than or greater than the number we found there? It's less than. So that's this case here. And it says, all right, low is going to stay the same. Because if, if we're ruling out the upper half, low doesn't need to change but we want high to move to the kind of the end of our, the lower half that we're considering. So that's why in our recursive call, we pass in mid minus one. So we do contains helper array zero, one, looking for 10. This would be high. Nope. This one would be high. We do 0 plus 1 is 1 divided by 2. Uh, we give us 0.5, but since, it, since it's an integer, it would throw away the 0.5 and give us 0. And at the, then at this point, we would say, we would find that, okay, target equals the number at the index mid and return true. Does that make sense how we're moving these indexes around for the recursive call? Why we would have a mid plus one and, and mid minus one? All right, I have another analysis task for you. Please work with your neighbors to analyze our binary search method. What is our big O complexity going to be? How someone share how you are thinking about analyzing this method? Liam? Um I started off ignoring like most of it. I was looking at the recursive calls. And each time it's calling, it's dividing by two. So I'm pretty sure it would be log n. Yeah, that's that's a great place to, to start with our recursive function, which is how many recursive calls you might make in the worst case, what is the most number of recursive calls we could make uh, if the, the size of our input is n, if the, the number, the size of the, of the array or list that we're searching is n. Uh, and Liam's exactly right that each time we're ruling out half of the remaining possible options. So just like, uh, uh, and, and so as we've talked about with, with merge sort, we keep dividing our input by two. We're going to make log n recursive calls.
And to go along with that, to finish our analysis, we need to ask how much work do we have to do per call? Anyone think about how much work in terms of our, our the size of our input would each recursive call kind of up to the point where it makes a recursive call. So for each separate call, how much work we have to do. Would the number of steps this function does prior to making a recursive call depend on the length of our array? Nope. It's going to do the same, check low greater than high, get the midpoint, check if target matches, and so we'll just do the same constant number of steps in each recursive call before making another recursive call. So our work per call is constant, big O of 1. Because the work we do per call doesn't depend on the size of our array. And so if constant amount per call, log n calls, means our binary search big O of log n. Which is pretty nice compared to our, our linear, the linear search, the loop over all the elements we were looking at earlier, that's O of n. So if we have something that's sorted and can do binary search, it's going to be much more efficient. What are your questions on this? All right, I have uh, one more. Uh, I have that kind of uh, big, interesting uh, kind, of kind of problem we can solve with when we're when we're, with the power of recursion and, and searching. Uh, before we get to that, however, I need to tell you about Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, also referred to as rather fraud B. Hayes, or I think his fraudulency, uh, because he was, he emerged, uh, uh, he was elected president out of possibly the uh, most uh, corrupt U.S. election, U.S. presidential election in history. So, situation was this, uh, 1876, and uh, the, the blue here is the, the Democrat, Tilden, the red, the states won by the Republican, Hayes. And after the votes were counted, uh, Tilden had 184 electoral votes. Uh, you needed 185 to win. Um, and Hayes had 165 and 20 electoral votes from, I think, South Carolina, Florida, and a couple other places. Uh, each party was claiming that it had won that state. So each party was claiming that their candidate had won the election. Uh, so there was no clear winner. Uh, and the decision of who would become president was turned over to Congress. Congress, uh, uh, Republicans controlled the Senate, Democrats the House. They appointed this 15-person commission, five people from the House, five from the Senate, five Supreme Court justices. This commission broke down, uh, just voted along party lines. The eight, eight Republicans voted to make the Republican president. Uh, this was the result of a compromise by which the Republican would become president and the federal government would let uh, uh, state governments in the South, uh, would let them alone, would end Reconstruction, by which, which meant deny the vote to black people. And so this... Uh, the outcome of this election was uh, an end to, to kind of reconstruction and uh, the, the effort to protect civil rights uh, in the South uh, and kind of set up the uh, situation where the Democratic Party uh, controlled politics in the South and the Republican Party uh, controlled politics in many of the northern states uh, and was really 
uh, a low point as far as uh, national politics goes uh, in the United States. All right. Bit of a downer, but so it goes. So perhaps we will raise our spirits by considering the following logic puzzle. Uh, we have a 4x4 four four grid. And we want to solve what's called the queen's problem. Queen here refers to the chess piece, a queen. Uh, and we want to, in a 4x4 four four grid, We want to place four queens on this 4x4 four four board such that uh, none of the queens threaten each other. And threaten here is they can't share a row, column, a row, column, or dag. So for example, if I put a queen here, I could not put a queen anywhere in this row, anywhere in this column, or anywhere in this diagonal. And so the challenge is, can I find a spot for four queens in this grid, such that none of them uh, are in the same row, column, or diagonal? So, rather than uh, trying to come up with a, a solution, rather, uh, rather trying to uh, uh, find, like, what are these four spaces, uh, I'd like you to brainstorm with your neighbors how you would approach finding a spot for each of these four. So, for example, uh, one approach might be to uh, try all possible positions of all four queens. Uh, but that would include trying something like this, being like, hmm, hmm could this be a solution? Uh, but I think when you brainstorm with your neighbors, uh, see if you uh, think about how you as a, a person, not necessarily a computer, would go about kind of trying to find uh, the solution to, to this problem. All right. I'm uh, hearing lots of good uh, good brainstorming out there. Uh, what's, uh, what's something that came up in your discussions about uh, how you would how you describe a sort of an approach to solving this problem? Oh, yeah. I think a nice way to do it would be to place the, um, the queens on the cases, the, well, the available case that covers the less number of cases. So just place it somewhere that sort of will not, you know, uh, limit the number of cases you can put one, um, another one. So in terms of that, then you have more cases to put other ones, and then those will put more cases where you have less cases to put other ones, and it's like sort of impressive. Yeah, so I I want to to pull out a few a few good points from that. The first is kind of you you might tend to naturally come up with an approach that is sort of incremental. I'm going to try placing one piece, and then another piece, and then another piece, until hopefully you find a way to put all of them down. Uh, the second was uh, 
a kind of rule or guideline for how you would decide where to place it. Uh, and you said it's kind of the, the place where it would sort of rule out the fewest, uh, the fewest spots. Um, there is uh, a term for this sort of uh, thing applied to a search in computer science. It's called a heuristic. Basically, I'm going to have a kind of rule of thumb or a guideline uh, that says kind of what choice is preferred over another. So here we might say, for each possible place we could put a queen, we're going to count up, we're going to find a value of how many spaces it would block. And then our heuristic is choose the spot that with the, the lowest value that blocks the fewest spaces. Coming up with a good heuristic, very challenging. It's, uh, and so, and, and it's going to be different from problem to problem, like what the, this sort of guideline is. Uh, and so this is a, a, a nice element of, of searching, but it's one that's kind of specialized. So uh, we will we'll kind of leave, leave that aside for now. And the, the, the final thing was that you might think of this process as recursive because we place one piece using some procedure and then we just repeat that same procedure. We recursively do that for the next piece and the next one, and so on. Uh, other ideas or, or aspects of an approach to solving this problem that came up in your discussion. Paul. Well, this is kind of an after the fact thing after it's already solved, but I noticed that there have to be five spaces around every clean place. Otherwise, it's more for this particular problem. Yeah, so that's another good point about a possible heuristic where there might be some aspect of the kind of number of uh, the position that we would, would, we would want, to, want to look for. Uh, what if I was, I was using this approach to place one piece at a time Okay, put the first one here, uh, can't do here, can't do here, uh, this looks like it works. Then, well, I know that as soon as I put a queen in one column, I can't put anything else in that column, so I'll sort of go column by column. So now I'm looking for a spot that works in this column, and all of them are, are, are not available. So... At this point, I put two down, and I'm like, oh no, I can't put a third one down, because I need one in this column in order for there to get four on the board. Uh, what should I do at this point? Yeah, what? Uh, pick up the one you just placed down. Exactly. I should undo my most recent choice and consider, well, maybe this would work. And okay, now I can put a third queen here, but again, I look in my fourth column and none of them are valid. What should I do at this point? Yeah, I should undo this one, keep considering, okay, this was the only valid spot in this column, I already tried it. So then I might undo this one. I've tried all of these and now I'm back to, okay, I need to undo this one and put it in a different spot. This process that we just went through of putting one down, kind of trying a choice, seeing how it plays out, and if we get stuck, sort of undoing our choices until we can try something new. This is a kind of algorithm called recursive backtracking. And recursion is going to be incredibly helpful to have a computer actually implement this kind of algorithm. Because a sequence of recursive calls, remember that when we make a recursive call and then we return to that, it, the original function picks up where it left off. So this is going to be a way for kind of each of these steps to remember 
what the previous choice was. So let's look at some code. Uh, not a doubly linked list. Okay, so one thing that makes uh, writing these kind of algorithms a lot easier is having some object that can keep track of where you put queens down, uh, and just kind of the, the state of the problem, uh, having an object that, that can do that for us. So there, I'm going, I have this board class that's going to represent our n by n board where we can put queens down. It's going to have some useful methods. All the code uh, that I'm about to go through, um, all these files will be, will be posted on the calendar. And I want to implement an explore method and a solve method. My solve method is just going to take in a board. It's going to be presumably an empty board of some size. Here it was four by four, but this algorithm is going to be able to handle kind of any size. And I'm going to do just what I did in the board and go column by column, and for each column, find a spot to put a queen in. And so my explore function is going to take a board and a column index that it should be trying to find a spot uh, a spot in. And in the case of this explore, like if this column index is all the way past the end of the board, is like past the last column, that must mean that I have successfully already placed a queen in all of the previous columns, kind of because I'm going to go columns left to right. So if the column is greater than the size of the board, that means that I must have found an actual solution to this queen's problem, and I'll print out that solution so the user can see it. So we can think of this as our base case we found a solution. Otherwise, if we haven't found a solution yet, I want to try all the valid spots in the column. So I'm trying to put uh, a queen in this particular column, and so I'm going to just try all the different spots where I could put a queen uh, in that column. So for int row equals one, this board class, the first row is index one. So that's why I'm, I'm starting row one. Uh, and while the row is less than or equal to the board size, row plus plus. So going through all the rows in this column, like, all right, I'm gonna consider putting a queen here, 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 or here. Uh, one of these four spots. And for each of these rows, this is a sort of common uh, approach to this recursive backtracking. Uh, try a choice, recursively explore that choice, unmake that choice. So I'm going to try, okay, try putting a queen here, and then sort of explore other possibilities from there. And then once I've finished that kind of recursive exploration, I'm going to unmake that choice so I can try a queen in the next spot. So what this will look like in code is uh, if, if it's safe to put a queen at this row column, I will try that choice. I'll put a queen at that row and column. I will then say, all right, I've put a queen at this column. Time to recursively explore 
uh, this same board, but from the next column onward. And then once that, once this returns, I know that I have explored all possibilities having, say, put a queen here. And it's time to remove that queen so that I could try the next, the next row. So the unmake choice here is board remove row column. And it turns out this code is all we need to do our recursive backtracking of all possible solutions to a particular queen's problem. That I can say, okay, to solve a board, I'm just going to start exploring the board at the first column. Any, uh, uh, so if we want to see this exploration strategy in action. Uh, there's code for a visual version here. It's gonna ask me what size of board I want. I'll say four. And we can see it's trying different spots and when it will put a queen down, when it finds it can't do a spot, it will then sort of undo the previous choice. And eventually we'll find a solution and we'll <laughs> be very happy with itself. Uh, and we'll have printed out that solution in the terminal. So I look, I found it. Wow. So this code to actually solve this, to do this recursive backtracking, kind of try all these different solutions, uh, was, didn't, wasn't very long, but is conceptually, uh, conceptually tricky because we are kind of recursively doing, uh, making a choice, recursively try all possible solutions from there. So there's some practice problems in the notes for today. Uh, that I think could be very helpful to to look through. Um, one question I had anyway, maybe you have it too, is is this solution much better than something that is just, okay, I'm just going to try every possible arrangement of queens and find the ones that are okay. So this algorithm doesn't consider this situation because it just it knows okay this can't lead to a a, a valid solution, uh, but uh, on approach without that might consider okay what about this, what about this, what about this kind of trying all these solutions that definitely won't work. Uh, is this part where we prune, where we avoid kind of going down some path of decisions? Uh, where it's like, okay, we never try one with these two. Does that save us much work? So uh, I did a little accounting. And kind of with looked at how many calls to the explore method does the solution with pruning do? How many does without pruning do? And I made a chart. So this red line here is the one that just is trying all possible arrangements of queens without considering, like, this is a dead end. Like, once you have two queens here, it doesn't matter where you put the queens over here, it's never going to work. Uh, so if you, this uh, green dotted line is N to the N. Big O N to the N is this dotted green line. And so without pruning, that's the, the complexity of our, of our search. If we use this pruning, if we say we're not going to kind of go down these dead ends that we can tell immediately are dead ends, uh, that's the blue line. And it is very similar to four to the end. So this is to say that our recursive backtracking is 
is exponential complexity because our input size n, the number of uh, uh, the dimension of our board, is in the exponent of uh, the performance. But there are better and worse ways to do this, even though both are exponential. And so doing it the way where we check, can I actually put a queen here before we start exploring down all those possibilities? That can save us a lot of work. That takes us from the, the red line uh, to, to the blue line on this, this log scale. All right. Uh, questions on this recursive backtracking? What parts of this don't make sense? All right, we'll have uh, some chance to practice a bit uh, next time. You'll be uh, for the upcoming lab, uh, you'll be implementing a recursive function that will find uh, valid boggle words. Uh, so you'll be given the code for a boggle game, and we want to be able to know, given the letters on this board, how what valid dictionary words can we find? Turns out recursive backtracking, very nice way to do this. Uh, the quiz is not out today. It will be out tomorrow uh, and due Thursday, so that it's not due the same day as the check-in post for Lab 4, which is due Wednesday. Lab 4's write-up will be posted later today. I have office hours in a few minutes, and I'll see you Wednesday.